the dinosaur question tonight, and so we will attempt to do so. But first, there's a story of two boys who were out in the woods, and they came across this large hole in the ground. They began to throw things down in it. They dropped a couple of rocks down in it and listened, didn't hear the bottom. Well, they thought, well, we need to get a bigger rock, and so they grabbed some bigger rocks, and they walked over to the edge, and they, they threw those football-sized rocks down, and surely they'll, they'll hear something. They listen. They don't hear anything. And so they finally looked around. We've got to have something bigger. And so they look, and they find this big uh, piece of uh, railroad tie. And so they said, well, well, we'll toss that in. Well, a railroad tie, if you don't know, is about two feet th- thick, about eight feet long, and uh, probably weighed 100, 150 pounds. Well, surely this will be big enough that when it hits the bottom, we'll hear it. And so they pick it up, one on each end, and they walk over to the edge, and they drop it in the hole. And just a few seconds later, they hear this this screaming and buzzing and, and something running through the woods, and they look, and here's this goat that's just flying, just, just running as fast as he can run. And he jumps up right before the hole, and jumps straight down in the hole. And they thought, what did I just witness? What did I just see? What just happened? And a few minutes later, an old farmer comes by, and he's calling out some name. And so they walk over to him and they say, well, what are you looking for? Well, I've lost my goat. You haven't seen a goat, have you? And they said, well, actually, just a few minutes ago, craziest thing we've ever seen. This goat came flying by us, jumped straight in the air, and jumped straight down in this hole. He said, well, that couldn't have been my goat. My goat was tied to a railroad tie. <laughs> Sometimes things are tied together. And that's the point uh, of the introduction, at least tonight. There are things that are kind of tied together. Uh, when you think about movies that have come out over the past several years, past a uh, couple of years, of course, Jurassic Park, Walt Disney's Dinosaur, Uh, Even uh, Toy Story, Ice Age, and others uh, that are out there, they uh, certainly have, dinosaurs have been thrust upon uh, by way of Hollywood and other things uh, like that. They have already uh, really caught on that a dinosaur, number one, every child loves dinosaurs, right? Uh, At least in, in some degree. Uh, to think about di- dinosaurs. Uh, there's, a, there's a mystique, there's an air about it, uh, and, and they just love to play with little dinosaurs, right? And think about how big they might have been and so forth. But you might remember uh, even this purple dinosaur in the middle uh, from about 28 years ago, uh, I believe is when Barney came out. Uh, but shows and movies that have thrust dinosaurs upon the public in such a such a masterful way, they have become the very poster child, if you will, for evolution. And so they have become really an evolutionary tool in a sense, which is unfortunate. But that's just kind of where we are uh, in society today. Since dinosaurs are so popular, the evolutionists see them and use them as an effective way to present this idea of evolution, this theory of evolution to our youngest of children. And so, and while, you know, who's going to suspect Barney's up to no good, right? Who's going to think about Toy Story and the little toys, that they're, they're doing something that, that's, that's wrong in some way. But it's how those things are being used, uh, as you can imagine. Dinosaurs then are often the first battleground in a person's life where creation and evolution... Uh, clash. And so I want us to take a look at some of those uh, questions. I want us to take a look at some of the main issues surrounding <clears throat> dinosaurs and think about these things uh, this evening. Let's, let's answer this first. Did dinosaurs really live on the earth? Well, in 1822, man, a doctor in fact, uh, by the name of Gideon Mantell and his wife Marianne, they set off in their buggy to go Uh, to treat a patient, and while the doctor was attending the patient, uh, his wife, 
Mary Ann went off on a, a little bit of a stroll and she came by this rock quarry and she sees a pile of rocks there, but something stands out and something catches her eye and she picks it up and it's not a rock, it's, it's a fossil and it appears to be a tooth. Well, she knows her husband's a, an avid fossil hunter, if you will, and so uh, he would certainly be interested in this. So when she gets back, she shows him, well, they go back to the quarry and in fact find several other teeth. It's very similar to the first that she had found. And then they began to show them to some prominent scientists of the day, but none could correctly identify what it was or what animal they once belonged. And so Dr. Man, uh, Mantell concluded, well, they must have belonged to some long-dead creature that was unlike any others that they had uh, previously known anything about. And so uh, those things kind of passed. But that particular rock quarry uh, was very popular. And by 20 years later, they had gotten to a point where they had found so many fossils, in fact, and so many teeth and so many bones that they were uh, discovered by various people, by the way, that it caused scientist Richard Owens to, he's the head of the British Museum of Natural History there in London, to conclude that a whole tribe of giant lizard-like reptiles had lived in the past. And so he named them dinosaurs. From two Greek words literally meaning terrible great lizard. A terrible great lizard. By the way, the Bible was translated into English somewhere in early 1600s, nearly 250 years prior to the word dinosaur being invented. And so you won't find the word dinosaur in your English Bible. And that makes sense. But since that time, so many fossils and uh, these magnificent creatures have been found. Uh, and, and so that it, it, it's obvious then that anyone who would deny their existence has not looked carefully at the evidence that has obviously been presented. Uh, a wealth of evidence has been found throughout the world. And so, first, let's make no mistake about it, dinosaurs did live. Well, when did they live? Let's answer that question. When was it that they lived? According to the theory of evolution, dinosaurs began to thrive about 175 million years ago. They ruled the earth for over 100 million years, became extinct about 65 million years ago, and according to then evolutionists, dinosaurs and humans were separated by a period of about 60 million years, give or take a million. What's a million when you're talking about that many, right? So that's the point. Now that they're very vague on those things, they, that's the general uh, time frames that are given by evolutionists. And so according to their theory, there's this large separation that, okay, yes, dinosaurs lived, but they lived so long before uh, humanity that they were separated by millions and millions of years. However, according to the biblical account of creation, all living creatures were fashioned on days five and six of the creation week. Exodus 20, verse 11 from our scripture reading. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And as, uh, as you study these particular things, the Bible teaches that the earth is uh, only a little over 6,000 years old. Some will go as much as 10,000. So some will put that figure out there, between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. Well, she's rather than a young earth, we would say, in comparison to the millions of years uh, needed to accomplish all things that evolutionists teach, and yet she's showing her age in many ways. Because while she's a young earth, she certainly was, is full grown as such in that, in that respect. And so there's a lot of things that are going on uh, and, and things that I might mention, and so those things may come in some other lessons, but we want to kind of stick to the topic at hand. Let's look together uh, for just a moment in Genesis chapter 1, beginning of verse 24. Genesis 1. <clears throat> verse 24.
And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so, and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over uh, all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, <clears throat> created he him, male and female created he them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fr fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God says, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food, also to every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every herb, green herb, for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I read that just to remind us when it comes to the day's of creation. In fact, we can see on day six, uh, not only then was man created on that day, but those living creatures, beasts of the earth, and so forth, made on that particular day. And so, as we noted then, day six. So, are we trying to say then that we're next door neighbors, that they were next door neighbors, both dinosaurs and human beings, coexisting? Same time frame? Well, that's, that would appear so. If day six, the beasts of the earth were in fact made on that day, and God made man in his own image on that day, then yes, that would naturally follow to be the case. Here's some evidence for us. In the early 1900s, there was an archaeologist by the name of Samuel, Dr. Samuel Hubbard. He was excavating in old uh, Indian ruins, uh, in uh, an area of the Grand Canyon, and on the walls of the canyon he found drawings. Numerous different kinds of animals, including elephants, uh, wild goat, and so forth, and also this interesting looking creature on the right hand side there, a dinosaur. What we very easily recognize to be a dinosaur. Near the drawings he found fossilized dinosaur footprints preserved in the rocks that were supposed to be, remember, 165 million years old or so. How would the Indians know how to draw such an animal, an accurate picture of a dinosaur that they had never seen or had never had described to them someone else having seen one? Remember, dinosaurs were not even identified in modern times until the early 1800s. Well, the Indians who made these rock drawings obviously lived many years prior to that. And so we look at some really serious evidence that is here. Yules Rudd found in Mexico some 30,000 artifacts. In fact, he would pay farmers to bring these little figurines that they would find, and some 30,000 were found. If you start looking at them, every imaginable type of dinosaur, uh, you can see those beasts that are, that are obviously, uh, that were fashioned in some form uh, by those who saw them, knew what they looked like, uh, very detailed in many ways, and very well preserved uh, nonetheless. Uh, found throughout Africa, uh, found throughout the world, and other finds in this verify the conclusion, though, that the evolutionary theory, the timetable, if you will, is completely inaccurate. They did coexist. How else would they know what they even looked like? And the very detailed uh, images that were either carved, shaped, or formed, or drawn on walls alongside of numerous other creatures that were there. Uh, human footprints have been found repeatedly in layers that are supposed to be millions of years old. Dr. Albert Ingalls, he's an evolutionist, discovered human footprints in the coal veins uh, throughout Kentucky, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and some other states. And again, this is that location where human footprints were found. 
in some of the areas that were supposed to be 250 million years old. On another occasion, you find uh, a trilobite, which is just a, a, a tiny fossil. But I want you to notice uh, the next picture that I'll show you in just a moment. These trilobites, according to evolution, these creatures lived about 500 million years ago. I want you to pay close attention to where this particular one had embedded itself in a shoe print of a human being, obviously. And so, if that's the case, how, how could a, a creature that existed 500 million years ago find its way into the shoe print of a human being? And so, yes, the evidence indicates to us that they coexisted at the same time. Somebody says, well, okay, well, give us book, chapter, verse uh, for those things. And again, you won't find the word dinosaur uh, in Scripture, but I believe that you will find uh, animals that are, in fact, mentioned that will have those characteristics of yet uh, some of the dinosaurs uh, that we would probably recognize. In fact, in Job 40, draw your attention there, Job 40, verses 15 through 24. <coughs> Job 15, or excuse me, 40, verses 15 through 24. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. Notice what God is, is telling Job here. And this, chap, this chapter and the next, uh, you know, Job has, Job's friends have made some accusations against God. Job, Job certainly has had his share of questions and misunderstanding about God, and God is now setting the record straight. And so he's saying, Job, look at the behemoth that I made along with you, or with mankind, obviously. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power and his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. His sinews uh, of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are beams of bronze. His ribs are bars of iron. His, <clears throat> he is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. Notice the language that is used, beast of the field. When we go back and read the Genesis 1 account, all those, uh, not just creeping things that creeped upon the earth, but also the beast of the earth and the beast of the field. That's not just cattle as we would typically think of it. In fact, he mentions cattle there in Genesis 1 as a separate grouping. And so notice how it's described, this behemoth, this huge creature that dwells near water. He eats plants like an ox. He has a tail that swings like a mighty cedar tree. And he has huge bones like beams of bronze. Uh, sounds like a beast if I ever heard one, right? Many have tried to say this intriguing creature, this is just simply an elephant. This is a hippopotamus. I want you to answer this question, and it doesn't take a Ph.D. to figure this one out. Does that look like a mighty cedar to you on the back of either of those animals? It doesn't, does it? The mighty cedars that are in reference there are some cedar trees that grow 120 feet tall. They themselves are beasts of trees. And truthfully, no animal matches the description of the behemoth better than um, the herb eating uh, dinosaurs known as uh, Diplodocus or any of the, the seropod dinosaurs uh, that would be out there, uh, Apatosaurus, there's numerous ones uh, that you can see on the screen behind me. Those have a tail like a cedar, very simply put. put. And not only that, <clears throat> you can see the idea that their, their, their muscle structure is going to be in their midsection, Right? in their stomach as such. And so that's, that's what is explained and described uh, concerning this particular animal. So my question is, why distort the description to make it fit some animal like an elephant or a hippo that it doesn't even describe at all when there are several extinct animals that certainly fit the description very easily? 
Here's another one in Job 41. Job 41. <clears throat> Not having time to read the whole chapter, but this whole chapter describes Leviathan. Can, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare, his tongue with a line which you would lower? So he's talking about fishing. Can you catch Leviathan out there while you're fishing? You drop a hook, you drop a, drop a line, you're going to catch this? Of course, the answer is, of course not. Can you put a reed in his nose, pierce his jaw with a hook, and on and on and on he goes. But I want you to jump over and look at some more of the description. Drop down to verse 18. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are, are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goes uh, burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. This amazing creature that is described here was indeed quite the astonishing animal. Whatever exactly it was, thought to be some type of sea creature that had the ability then to uh, breathe fire. Well, where does your mind go when you think about that? Well, it's not a crocodile. <laughs> because that's what many people will say. And some translations have even mistakenly added that word in there. That's not what we're talking about here. The crocodile has a soft underbelly, right? And of course, he doesn't breathe fire smoke. So it's not him, whatever it is. But where does your mind go when you start thinking about breathing fire and smoke and uh, such as an animal like this? Your mind goes to a dragon, right? And you say, okay, well, dragons, all right, Wayne. Now, <clears throat> dragons never really lived, did they? No, well, did they? <laughs> That's the question, isn't it? First of all, we need to remember that historical writings, not just mythical writings, not just the legends that have been written through the years, but historical writings that have no need to, to make up characters or individuals or any such thing. They're not mythical. They're not legendary. Just historical literature from numerous countries throughout the world. <clears throat> China, Taiwan, Korea, Great Britain, numerous others. Have story, have historical record, I should say, about such animals as these. In some case, in cases, it's, it's lines, uh, line drawings of the animals accompany the stories that were told, accompany the, uh, the history of the descriptions that were given of these particular animals that they've seen. They've drawn pictures of what they saw. Well, that's the first thing we need to remember. The second thing is, if an electric eel can produce 500 volts of static electricity, and yet live underwater, by the way, and enough electricity to kill a grown person, if a 200-pound or bigger Komodo dragon can run as fast as a horse, if a bombardier beetle can produce a chemical bomb that explodes from its body at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, why is it so difficult to believe that an animal could breathe fire and smoke? The animal kingdom is filled with all sorts of weird and intriguing animals. That's what drew Charles Darwin in by just looking at even the, the, the finches, the, the, the birds and the different species of, of, of birds and, and all of those things. He was drawn in to, to the, the masterpiece that God has created. When you think about the creation... And yet the animals themselves are quite real and not fictitious in any way. So the question then, well, what happened to these dinosaurs? And I'm going to admit to you, no one knows exactly. There's a lot of different theories, a lot of different ideas that are out there, but no one knows exactly what happened to the dinosaurs. In his book, in fact, uh, the Great Dinosaur Mystery in the Bible, a man by the name of Paul Taylor, noted there are 25 different theories out there 
trying to explain the extinct, extinction of these terribly great lizards. One theory suggests a large comet struck the earth, sent a huge amount of dirt into the air. That dirt and smoke and worldwide fires blocked out the sun's rays, caused temperature to drop drastically, resulted in the death of much of the earth's vegeta vegetation. These dinosaurs could not function, could not eat, therefore sent them into extinction. And maybe there's another possible idea as well. Now think about this with me. Think about Noah and the flood. The evolutionists don't want us to talk about this, don't want us to bring this up. But the flood of Genesis chapter 6 through 10, we know God destroys every living creature on land that was not taken into Noah's ark. Thousands of dinosaurs were probably killed in the flood, bones buried very quickly, and would exp uh, give some explanation to the mass graveyards of dinosaurs that are out there in the world today, found all over the world. Some in some of the highest regions of the earth have been found. Some dinosaur fossils have been found. After the flood, the earth would have been quite different as it was before. And so the dinosaurs maybe did not flourish like they did prior to the flood due to that change in climate, the change in food supply. And yes, I said a change in climate. And so... Uh, maybe I caught the left's attention with that one. Uh, there was certainly a climate change. There, there were things that changed by way of the makeup of the earth as it was after the flood. The pre-flood earth was no more. It was completely different. And certainly we know that not all of them became extinct all at once because we have those people who drew pictures of them, who made clay figurines of them, and we have numerous ones uh, in, in evidence even today. Perhaps they became extinct because they could not find enough food. Maybe men hunted them too heavily. Uh, we've seen that in our own um, recent years, that to be the, the case with certain animals. We simply do not know why the dinosaurs are extinct, and maybe we never will know the, the true answer. But here's what we do know. When we look at the evidence, number one, dinosaurs did exist. And, and of that fact, there is no doubt whatsoever. Number two, they did not, however, live millions of years separated from human beings. According to the Bible, they too were created by God on day six. Even scientific findings show they lived alongside of human beings. The description, number three, of animals in Job prove that huge creatures resembling dinosaurs existed on the earth at the very same time as man. When God is questioning Job, Job has an understanding of what these animals are. Maybe we don't fully comprehend what they are and what they look like, but Job certainly did. And the point was very clear as God was explaining himself to Job. It's not difficult. It's not difficult at all to believe that these amazing creatures, like dinosaurs, coexisted with mankind when you ex begin to think about their, their characteristics with other existing animals that we know today. Uh, we mentioned the eel, the bombardier beetle, and, and numerous others, the Komodo dragon, uh, numerous. And we see similarities in their characteristics. But establishing the fact that dinosaurs lived at the same time as men shows the evolutionist timetable when it comes to the age of the earth, when it comes to the idea of dinosaurs and men existing together, it just does not add up. What use is a theory then? Here's my question. What use is a theory that, on, that not only misses the bullseye, but completely misses the target altogether? That's the dinosaur question that I have. When we study these things, I realize these have no bearing on our salvation, but it does have bearing when it comes to God's Word being proved to be inspired, God's Word proven to be true, and archaeologists continue to uncover the mysteries of the world, right? 
And they simply continue to be tacked on over and over as evidence to God's Word being absolutely true and inspired of God. We can rest assured in it. And what it does is it helps build our faith in God, the great creator of these magnificent animals. No wonder then David would say, why would you be mindful of me? But God certainly was mindful of David, and He's mindful of me and you as well. He's mindful in the way that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you, for me. That we could be saved from our sins, that we could have redemption, that we could be justified, that we could be counted as righteous before God. Knowing that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, we have to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Confess our faith even before men. Repent of sin and be baptized to wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. The Lord is mindful of me and you. He's concerned about our souls, and therefore He sent His Son. Are you concerned about your soul? Do you need to obey the gospel? Or as a Christian, the one who has already obeyed, do you need to make things right with God? If we can help or encourage in some way, come to the front while we stand and while we sing.